the holiness of God. Do anybody remember what last week's attribute was? The immutability of God, the eternal God, meaning that immu immutability means that God cannot change. And then we went over Jonah, and then we also went over Genesis 6 and 9, which most people look at the word repent, and they think that God repented, but actually when the person repents, as far as salvation, okay? Let's think about salvation. When righteousness is imputed on our behalf, the holiness of God treat us as the Son of God and as righteousness. Now, when Jesus Christ was on the cross, what? He did not struggle with sin. He struggled with what? Holiness. So being that he struggled with holiness, he never knew what? Sin. So therefore, he took our place and in union with the believer, he took on sin. He did not sin. He was a man who knew no sin, but he took on sin. He was the sin bearer. He was the perpetuation. He was the substitute. Therefore, Christ and his holiness and justice had to deal with him as if he committed the crime. So when we talk about his immutability, we talk about he deal with people according as their character and their conduct. If they change their character and conduct, he deal with them differently. God no more longer treat us as a sinner. He treat us as a what? Son. As a Christian. Also, we talked about the eternality of God. In the beginning, what? God. So God has always existed, past, present, and also the future. But today, we want to talk about one of the most highest attribute that is ever known that God wants to be known by. When we lift up our Bibles, we say that is the Holy Bible. When the Spirit that came from God, it is the Holy Spirit. When we read Scripture, it is what? The Holy Scriptures. When God commands us out of any attribute, He say, be ye holy because what? I am holy. So we see the main attribute that is high, exalted, and lifted up is holiness. When we think about holiness, we think about His glory. We think about His majesty. We think about pureness. We think about that the soul that sin will surely die because He is what? Holy. And therefore, being that He's holy, He's a just God. And that no sin can be in the presence of God. But we have moved from the non-communable attributes now to the moral attributes. So what does that mean? That means these are attributes that we can participate in. We are not immutable. We change. People and events change. We're not eternal. Why? Because we're going to die one day. Uh, we're not omnipresent. We're here now, but we're not home with our family, friends, or somewhere else at the same time. We're not omniscient. When I try to discern which one of my kids is right or wrong, I'm not omniscient. I don't know which one is right. I can only discern by what they tell me. We're not omnipotent. We don't have all power in our hands. But now we come into attributes that we can participate in. But notice it's going to be first the holiness of God. The basic meaning of holiness is set apart or separation. Many see holiness as the foremost attribute of all because holiness pervades all the other attributes of God and is consistent with all he is and does. God is absolutely distinct from all his creatures and is exalted above them. Notice this, infinite majesty. What do we see in Isaiah 6? We see the Lord high and lifted up. One thing is God has transcended over the culture. Why? Because people and events change, but this eternal God and his consistency and holiness, he never changed. What did Moses say? Moses didn't ask to see anything else but his majesty, his glory. He didn't ask to see his hand. He didn't ask to see his butt. He wanted to see his face. He wanted to see the full totality of his holiness. But what did Jesus say? You cannot look on my holiness. Why? Because Moses, from Adam to Moses, all have what? Sin. And therefore, sin cannot be in the presence of God. 
His face is his full character. If Moses was to see Christ in his full holiness, majesty, and glory, he would have disintegrated, exploded in front of God's holiness. This is how much God do not play with sin that he even offered up his own son. If he offered up his own son and he allowed his son to become the sin bearer and allowed the wrath of God for three and a half hours to be upon his own son, what do you think he's going to do with unbelievers? But notice scripture statement setting forth the facts of God. Notice Isaiah. He talks about he is separate from sin. Isaiah 57, 15 says, Thus saith the high, lofty, transcendent, notice the one is capitalized, that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. God said in the book of Psalms, we read this early in the semester, do you think that I am like man? What does Romans chapter 1 say that man is trying to make a God after a man? We try to judge like a man. God is not like that. He is not impartial. Why? Because when he rendered judgment in his holiness, the soul that sinned, that do not have the blood of Jesus Christ, his imputed righteousness, which is his holiness and majesty, he will spend eternity in hell. That's sad to God. Not only do we see he is separate from sin, but he is to be worshipped. When the Bible said that we must worship him in spirit and in truth, one of the truth is that sin cannot be in his presence. And therefore, when I come, I recognize that I have been made holy, not by my own admission, but because he initiated to impute righteousness to my account therefore I begin to worship him not only that because the way that he dealt with sin he was a just God and say I cannot allow sin to get off the hook but notice this he said the lamb of God that was slain before the beginning of the foundation God had already in first Peter a chosen people, a chosen nation who have elected, who have chosen what? In the beginning what? God. So it's not that we chose him. He chose us. But notice in his solitariness, he needed nothing to be added or subtracted to be satisfied. But Isaiah 53 said, it pleased the father to bruise his only son. Why did Jesus Christ need a body. Because being God, he could not die. One man had to stand in our place, but this man had to be holy. When we go to Exodus chapter 12, when we go to Exodus chapter 13, and we talk about the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb was symbolic of what Christ would be. Notice the lamb had to be without spot, without what? Blemish, Blemish without wrinkle, unblemished, unwrinkled. Without spotted, James says, from the world. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, which is of the what? World. They that love the world have become enemies against God. When you are prideful, you come against God's holiness. And when you come against His holiness, you have made yourself an enemy of the state. But notice Psalms 99 and 9. Notice it says, exalt the Lord our God and worship Him. Notice this, at His holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. The reason that we worship the Almighty God because He's not like Buddha. He's not like Hindu. He's not like Jehovah Witness. This is a man who knew no sin, who took upon sin, that we may be holy. You want to say something that's set apart from any religion? He was a man who knew no sin. He is worthy of all the worship. Now, when we talk about the word holy, it's the word to be made whole. W-H-O-L-L-Y. 
So what does that mean? When he have wisdom, it's whole wisdom. When he have justice, it's the whole justice. When the wrath of God comes upon a man and he deserves it, it's all of his wrath. It's not partial. It's the whole thing. God is consistent in all that he do. We saw that he is to be worshipped in Psalms 99. We saw that he is separate from sin. But the third thing is his hatred for sin. Habakkuk 1, 13. You who are of pure eyes. Notice Habakkuk is describing the holiness of God. In Revelation chapter 1, he said his eyes is like fire. It's pure. What does fire do? It burns off anything that is not pure. He can see in your wicked heart. That's why God, when he's holy and he judges men of their motives, he look at with an intensive, pure eyes. Why am I excited tonight? Because we're talking about holiness. We're talking about one of the greatest, highest attributes that God wants to be known by. Habakkuk 1.13, you who are pure eyes then to behold evil. Evil cannot be in the presence of a holy God. When Lucifer began to lift himself up with pride and desire to take the holy throne, he could not remain in the presence of a holy God. Even though Lucifer was made to be a holy, perfect angel, he became an enemy of the state. And guess what? Lucifer. In Matthew chapter 25, he has a destination. It's the broad way that leads to destruction. And guess what? This unholy creature is trying to carry every mankind to his destination. But we praise God for his holiness. Because with great love, his holiness, he knew that he needed a holy substitute. He needed a holy perpetuation to take away my sins. What a loving God. But he was not worrying about me. He was worrying about his holiness. In order for you to be accepted, you got to have his holiness. Come on now. Don't let this get too simplicity for you. Because that's very complex that he crushed his only son because of his holiness. His holiness, God demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Now, God demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ, come on now, we're talking about holiness. But how can we as believers make this applicable in our lives. It's not the place of church that makes it holy. It's not you who carry around Jesus that makes it holy. Moses in Exodus chapter 3 have walked on that mountain for 40 years with his sandals. But that very day when the great I am came and said, I am that I am. What made the mountain holy? What made the bush holy? Because the presence of God was there. When you look at Exodus, when they began to make the mercy seat, the perpetuation where the blood would be poured in, where the holies of holies, it was just a piece of wood. It was just a piece of tree. The carpenters came down and, and molded it to the seraphims and the cherubims for the blood to be poured on the mercy seat. But that is not what made it holy. When the glory of God, Shekinah glory, rests on the mercy seat, then it became the holies of holies. You want to talk about Leviticus? Leviticus, he says everything needs to be set apart. Whatever incense you use for the temple cannot be used at home. So what God is saying I am not to be used flippantly or commonly. So what do people do with his holy name? They curse his name. They blaspheme his name. GD all everywhere. But they will want to stand up and beat somebody over if you use their mama as a cuss word. Your mama. Oh, what? And they want to fight. But when we hear people at the workplace, in the marketplace, saying GD, we don't stand up for his holy name. 
when Joshua was getting ready to go to battle. <coughs> and the captain of the army host, which we saw in Isaiah 6, he had his sword drawn out. He said the very same thing that he said to Moses. Take off your shoes for where you stand is holy ground. The question is today, I don't care if you come in the seminary training, I don't care what church you go to, I don't care how many altars you done cried out, I don't care how much time you have cried out for mercy, I don't care how much intellectual books you done read by uh, Toja, MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, that does not make you holy. Reading scripture, memorizing verses, it don't make you holy. What makes us holy? The holy Spirit. We were just a vessel, just like the cherubim wood, just like the ground that Moses walked on, just like when Joshua was getting ready to go to battle. He already, if he'd been an army soldier, he already done spotted out the land. He done walked there before, but when the presence of God come in our life, look at number four. God's personal name is to be holy, and his people should be holy. But unfortunately, the, the nominal Christians, and especially pastors, are not carrying the holy, reverential name of God anymore. No one has a respect when they, when they go past a church to turn their music down anymore. No one has a respect for a minister or a pastor. Okay, you're, you're just regular to me. Why? Because... The men on TVN or wherever are not upholding the holy name. They're not a peculiar people anymore. They look like us. They talk like us. They're worldly like us. They know more 50 Cent and Beyonce more than I do and they in the church. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 15 through 16. But as he which called you. Who called you? Who has predestined you? Who has chosen you? He called you not to be regular. When you look at Leviticus, everything is set apart. Uh, just like my boy say, set apart like oil and water. It should not mix. Now, I'm not saying you can't watch football. I'm not saying that you cannot participate in recreational things. But when you lose a game, how is your holy conduct? How is your holy character? When I bump you and coming in, how is my holy character and conduct? Well, even if I do mess up, do I repent? Is my life filled with repentance? Even if I do mess up, even if I do slip, do I show remorse? No, I'm not because I sin, but because I know who I sin again. Come on now. It's all right to say amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Because this God that was holy sacrificed for us. I'm excited about this part tonight. Because this was set apart our God from an adulterous pedophile Muhammad. This was set aside our God from an enlightenment Buddha. This was set aside our God from a Hindu God that he will not tolerate sin. I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. But as he which call you is holy, so you should be holy. In all men of conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let's wrap this up with application implication. The scripture emphasizes the fact that God is holy. His essential nature is holiness. God's holiness is manifest in hatred of sin, delighting in righteousness. In his separation from those living in sin, cut with his attribute of eternity, this will be an eternal, eternal separation. He also make it known in the light and righteousness, and in him making provision for man to become holy in character and conduct.